check. Praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't we clap our hands unto Jesus today? I don't know why somebody gave me a builder's protein, but I think someone is trying to say that I'm not looking as buff as I know I am. So God rebuke them in Jesus' name. Just kidding. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord today, hear from God today? Always a privilege to be in God's house. You just never know what's going to happen in the house of God. And uh, I was on an airplane yesterday, and uh, we may be on national news one of these days. I was talking to the Southwest Airline pilots and to the people, and I told them, I said, do you guys have anyone that can give you guys a religious exemption? And they said, not at the moment. We've been looking. And I said, here's my card. Email me. Call me. I said, I'll sign every one of them. And, uh, and uh, they said, are you sure I can get you in trouble? And I said, listen, er who cares? Let's have some fun. Let's see what Jesus does in the end. Praise God. So one of these days you may see Cornerstone North signs all Southwest Airline pilots. <laughs> hey, why not? Praise God. Hallelujah. So if they're watching, they said they were going to watch the service. If you're watching, God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm excited for what God's going to do today, and uh, why don't we stand in the house of the Lord. We're going to pray for God's presence. Welcome to our first-time visitors, and uh, God bless you. We've been praying for you. So glad you're with us today. It's good to see Sister, is that Sister Nevaeh somewhere? God bless Sister Nevaeh, Sister Felicia. We love her. She is, every time I see Sister Nevaeh, that song comes to mind. She is my sunshine, my only sunshine. She's such a sweet girl. We love Sister Nevaeh. Amen. It's good to see my friend Ryan. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Amen. Ryan works for 509 Services, and he's a great, great man, and we're so glad he's with us. And everybody's so glad to be in the house of the Lord. Hey, why don't we pray at the end of the day? I want Jesus to do something today. Amen. I, I'm excited for what God wants to do in people's lives today. So let's pray for his presence to be with us in a special way as our musicians make their way up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be with you. It's such a blessing, Jesus, that you've given us a great group of people that love you, that want to worship you, that want to praise you. Lord, we're anticipating and expecting you to do whatever you want to do in this service. This is your church. These are your people. And we want your will to be done today. God, have your way. Touch hearts, touch minds, bless people, answer prayers, pour out miracles, signs, and wonders, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that we can worship and praise you the way you deserve it. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise because you are God alone and there's none beside you. If you're going to worship with us today, would you clap your hands unto Jesus? Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Come on, don't be afraid to clap your hands. Run into wide open spaces, braces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, braces waiting. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the spirit is here. Let there be freedom. Let there be freedom. All of your burdens, bring all of bring your all scars. Come back to communion, come back to the sun, and run into wide open spaces. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting, waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. 
Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle And I know, I know You never will Everything's possible By the power of the Holy Ghost A new wind is blowing right now Breaking my heart of stone Taking over like it's Jericho And my walls are all crashing down But right now, I know you're able And my God, come through again You can do all things You can do all things You never lost a battle, no, you never lost a battle. And I know, I know, I know, you never will. You can do all things, you can do all things, but fail. Cause you never lost a battle, no, you never lost a battle. And I know. I know you never will. Never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. Never will. Never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. You never will. It doesn't matter what you're going through today. He is greater. The battle is already won. He has the victory. Somebody give him praise for that. Somebody thank him in advance for what he's about to do. The miraculous in this place today. You can do it. You can do it. He's worth it. Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle I know, I know You never will You can do all things You can do all things But fail Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle I know I know you never will. One more time, I know, I know you never will. I know, I know you never will. Hallelujah. Let's lift up our hands and praise Him. Thank you, God, for never failing. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let's clap our hands unto Jesus. Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody say participator. When Germany declared war on Great Britain, the founder of the Wiccan religion decided that he was going to fight back against Hitler's forces upon the threat of invasion. And so he gathered a bunch of Wiccan witches together, and they went to a side of the island where Hitler was supposed to invade. And they started a fire, and they began to chant, you will not invade, you will not invade, you will not invade. The founder of Wiccan said that they did that into the late hours of the night until a storm came and prevented Hitler from moving ships into their shores. They believed with all their heart. In fact, he says that many of the people that went out there to dance through the night in the middle of the rain died uh, right after they did that. Now, this is a Wiccan religion praying to demonic forces. And upon the interview, they asked him, what is one of the principles of your religion? This is what he said. And I thought, I said, man, I, I need to copy and paste this. He said, one of the principles of our religion is there's no spectators. There's only participators. 
Because spectators have no power. But participators can stop an invading army. And I just thought to myself, I wonder if some Jesus name people would get a revelation that when you get together, participate and let God do the miraculous in your life. My God in heaven, God is so good. So if you're sitting next to someone that participated, thank God for that because that means there was power available next to you. Hey Amen. If you're sitting next to a spectator, just find, some, find yourself another seat. Sit next to a participator. You don't want someone to drag out all the power in the room. Praise God. Tuesday night Bible study, you don't want to miss that. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus 24 and a Super Sunday next week with Brother Cornelius Williams. We are so excited for what God's going to do. And Luke 20, uh, Leviticus 24, I apologize, yeah, Leviticus 24 and 17. And I uh, have a, a topic here that I really believe can help us. Uh, I believe God's going to heal marriages today. I believe God's going to heal families today. I believe God's going to heal couples and single people. I believe God is going to just do a great work in your life uh, if you will apply this principle moving forward. And uh, I, Leviticus, for a lot of people, they're like, what is that? It's the Old Testament, and it's in your Bible, I promise. So Leviticus 24 and 17, look what the Bible says. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast, shall, a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so that shall be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. You shall have one manner of law. Everybody say law. As well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. And uh, with the help of the Lord today, I want to preach on a very simple topic, the law of reciprocity, the law of reciprocity. Somebody say, preach to me, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. hoping you guys got me smart water so I can do good today, but this will do. Contextually, this book was given after the Exodus. Now, this is, uh, I'm not going to park here, but I do think it's, it's worth stopping and taking a view here, that God placed Leviticus right after the Exodus for a reason, and that is, is because the first priority of God for his people, especially if you're in slavery, you're lost, you're bound up, is I'm not concerned with rules and regulations. I'm concerned with getting you saved. I'm concerned with getting you in the church before I make you a member of the church. Okay? And so the book of Leviticus is like this. It's laid out in a way. So essentially, if you're here today and you have not been baptized in Jesus' name because you haven't repented of your sins, I always say, this is my theology, you can take it or leave it, but it's in the Bible. I believe when someone really repents, they get baptized in Jesus' name. How you doing today? <laughs> See, I believe that. I believe true repentance leads you into Jesus' name baptism. And I believe that because true repentance is the complete abandonment of all false doctrines, false ideologies, or false perspectives or false interpretations. So when someone refuses to get baptized in Jesus' name, they're actually refusing to repent. They're refusing to say, I'm wrong, the Bible's right. I'm wrong, Peter's right. I'm wrong, Paul was right. I'm wrong, the Word of God is right. So repentance is the turning away. Baptism is the, baptism is the remission of sin. And the infilling of the Holy Ghost is what it, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Instead of it being outside of us, it's now within us. So Leviticus is, is, is commonly known as the book of priest, the law of priest. But it's placed there precisely in a brilliant matter because God is inviting people that were slaves to sin and slaves to an Egyptian culture to become priests. But how can I be something that I don't even know exist? I need you to catch that. How can, how can God expect Egyptian slaves to become God's people? That's, 
That's, that's an impossibility. That's an improbability. When, 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 any, when, 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 when one of these people would get in a fight, how do you think they fought? They fought like Egyptians. You catching that? All they knew was the Egyptian way. They were raised in Egypt. They were taught by Egyptians. They spoke the language. They dressed like Egyptians. Their diet was Egyptian. Their, their gods were Egyptian. They cried to the Egyptian music. They danced to the Egyptian music. This is why you got people in church that they'll dance to all kinds of worldly music, but they won't dance in the house of the Lord. It's because, because they were raised in Egypt. They believe you can dance in Egypt, but you can't dance in God's presence when the Bible tells us that David danced before the ark of the Lord. So it's the Egyptian mindset, the Egyptian way, the Egyptian dress, the Egyptian customs, the Egyptian emotions, the Egyptian worldview. And God is telling them, hey, guess what? You're not in Egypt anymore. And because you're not in Egypt, I'm going to give you some new set of ways to live. Because if I get you out of Egypt and you still live and act and talk and dress and behave like the Egyptians, Egypt is still inside of you. And if Egypt is in you, then that means wherever you're at, Egypt is there. Are you, are you reading the same Bible I am? I hope we're, I hope we're on the same page here. You got to understand this. This is why God has to get the Egyptian out of us. Because we're meant to be representatives, ambassadors of Christ, not Egypt. So God says, hey, I got to clean you up. I got to clean you out. I got to dress you up. I got to get your mind right, your diet right, your emotion right, your feelings right, your God's right. I got to get it all right. Why? Because you're no longer in Egypt because I don't want Egypt in you. Are you catching that? God said, I'm trying to get you out of Egypt because I want to get Egypt out of you. God knows what he's doing. All they knew was the Egyptian way. Now, I'm not a theologian. I'm not brilliant. But I think we can make a simple assessment if you look around a little bit that every community, every club, every organization has information that makes them who they are. That makes sense? Like a doctor, his information makes him a doctor. You catch that? Hallelujah. A Raider fan, we know that he's, his IQ is probably really low. and makes him who he is. We pray for those brothers. Every time I see someone with a Raider hat, I'm like, Lord, touch his mind. Lord, if he's going to like a team, at least let it be a winning team. God have mercy. Praise God. Information makes us who we are and what we are. Baptists are Baptists because of the information that they're fed. Methodists are Methodists because of the information they're fed. Protestants are Protestants. Catholics are Catholics. Christians are Christians because of the information they're fed. What we allow in is what's going to form us. And this is why God gave us Leviticus. Amen. Pastor, I don't believe the Old Testament is, is applicable to us. Great. Why would God place the book of priests in the Old Testament and then trip us up by calling you a priest? That makes sense. First Peter 2 9. Let's because this is in the New Testament. Okay. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It, it, it's amazing that out of all the things that God could have done, he tells Peter, this is what I want you to tell my Gentile churches. I want you to tell them that there are a royal priesthood. Which means you can't be an Egyptian slave. You can't be a Roman slave. You can't be a Babylonian slave. You can't be an American slave. You can't be a slave to the American way because Jesus is the way. Did you catch that? You can't be a slave to the American way because you need Jesus to be the way. We need to be his peculiar people, his holy nation. 
we are called to be His. You need to understand this. It's very important because what, what we're trying to comprehend here today is that these principles in the Bible are applicable to us because God is not holding us accountable to the Egyptian way. He's holding us accountable to His way. He's not telling us, you got to live up to the world's standards. you got to live up to my standards. And guess what? God is holy. So he calls us a holy nation. And this is why God gives you the holy to make you holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. Well, God, how do I get holy? You need me inside of you. This is why churches that don't believe in the infilling of the Holy Ghost have unholy people. You can't be holy without the Holy Ghost. Amen. This book deals with many things, but I want to deal with one particular portion of Scripture, which is the law of reciprocity. Now, let me break it down for everyone, because I'm sure, how many of the kids here know what that word means? Reciprocity. Who knows what it means? All right. Praise God. We're going to start homeschooling our kids, because they go to public school and it's not working. So, uh, church, let's take up an offering right now. We're going to do a homeschool, because evidently they are not teaching them how to read. Hallelujah. God help the public school system in Jesus' name. Okay, what does this mean? This is a basic law of social psychology. It literally means this. In social, in social situations, we pay back what we've received from others. Everybody say payback. Oh, yes, we're real good at that. <laughs> I'm going to get you back this way. In other words, there is a divine principle that exists in the entire planet pertains to humans. And that is, we are masterful at paying people back. They pop one tire, we pop two. They cook for you bad ones, you give them food poisoning. Thank God he saved me. <laughs> hey, I, I want you to read it through the lens of reciprocity, through the lens of payback. Go back to Leviticus 24. I want them to see this. I want them to read this the way it's written. And he, and he that kills any man shall be what? 24-17. There it is. He that kills any man shall do what? Payback. And he that, killeth a, he that kills a beast shall, be, shall make it good. And put to death. Payback. Look at the next verse. And if a man cause a blemish on his neighbor, and he has done, so it shall be done to him. Payback. Breach for a breach. Eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. He that causeth a blemish in a man, so it shall be done to him again. In other words, the Bible wants every one of us to know that this, this nature, this law of reciprocity is real. All of us. Do this. None of us are exempt from this. This shaped Israel's behavior. Their social dynamic was, was shaped by this. Pastor, I don't know if I believe that. Well, great. Jesus had to deal with this behavior. Matthew 5, 38. Look what the Bible says. Now, we're fast forwarding a couple thousand, a few thousand years. Look what the Bible says. Matthew 5, 38. It says, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for an eye. Are you noticing this? That means that 4,000 years later, this culture, these, these, these Israelites, these Jewish people obeyed the word of God so much that people were popping each other's eyes. People were giving each other black eyes. People were, people were like walking around missing teeth, and you're like, what happened to you? Oh, I popped somebody else's tooth out, so they popped mine out. The culture was shaped by this principle. And so Jesus was dealing with a generation that believed in payback. And so Jesus says, hey, You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I understand that this is what you've been taught. I understand because I want you to notice this. I want you to notice this. God took them from Egypt and made them his people. And then they hijacked his principles and became Jewish. But Jewish is inferior to Christianity because Christianity the true revelation of the principle wasn't, let's go, I have a permission slip now to pop someone in the eye. 
The, this wasn't God saying, hey, I want you to find someone and give them a black eye, but don't forget, you're going to get one back. And hey, w- which one of you guys needs your tooth extracted? I'll help you. God said, that's, that's the Jewish interpretation of my word. But let me tell you what I actually meant. Next verse. But I say unto you, everybody say I. I. Who, who's the great I am? He said unto them that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn also to him the other. Wait a minute. What? This must be a boxing lesson because you can only throw a left hook by going through the other cheek. So if you hit you on the right, go to the left or vice versa, however it works. I'm not a boxer, praise God. I should be, though, hallelujah. Are you catching what the scripture is saying here? Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to teach you what I really meant. I've heard a lot of theologians try to talk their way out of this one. Hey, let me just give you a simple revelation that Jesus wanted to impart to Christians. Because these are, these are the Christians. These are Jewish boys that are, that are about to be transformed into Christians. And God says this. I'm going to tell you what I really want you to do. Somebody has to stop. The negativity and the evil effects of the law of reciprocity. Are you catching that? God says, hey, it's in our nature. You hit me, I hit you. And it's a never-ending cycle of terror. It's a never-ending cycle of fighting. It's a never-ending cycle of hurt and pain. And And Jesus says, I've been watching you guys for 4,000 plus years, and you guys are not good at stopping this. So let me go ahead and let you know what you're supposed to do. I gave you this word as a preventative, not as a permission slip. And so God says, let me tell you what needs to happen. Somebody has to take initiative in the relationship and stop the negativity and stop the side effects of evil. Somebody has to say, oh... I have permission to hit you back, but I ain't going to. I have permission to insult you back, but I ain't going to. I have permission to put you down because you put me down, but I'm not going to. And I'll tell you why. Because I want to stop the law of reciprocity. And God says, this is what I want you to do. This law can't be broken. It's real. It exists. It works. So God says, I designed this law so that you can understand that you have two choices. Set something good in motion or set something bad in motion. You catching that? He says, somebody needs to start and initiate the positive effects of the law of reciprocity. Somebody, oh, you're not catching this. He, he's saying somebody has to initiate forgiveness. Hello. He's saying somebody has to be willing to say, hey, we can duke this out until we die. Or somebody can say, I forgive you. It hurts. It hurts God. That's how I feel right now. Lord. Uh. Hey, guess what? If you punch me and I punch you back, guess what's coming next? A punch is coming back my way. And then a punch is going your way. And then a punch is coming my Hey, I, you know, and the devil is a spectator. The devil, the, the devil will hit you in the back of the head, hit your wife on the back of the head, and then sit down and watch you two duke it out. <laughs> you're stupid. No, you're stupid. You're ugly. You're uglier. Well, you married me. Well, you married me. And the devil's, the devil's kicking back like, man, this is really fun. I did not know I can get people to act this foolishly. You catching that? And Jesus is like, folks, I've been watching you guys for thousands of years, and this is all you guys do all day is fight. And he says, here, let me give you some wisdom. Why don't you just turn the other cheek and see what happens? Why don't you just, you're blah, 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 blah. You're, what's for dinner? (laughs) Hey, hey, 
Hallelujah. Woo. Hey, bro, listen. Even if she's mad, if she can cook, you're going to eat. It has to be better than Taco Bell. You feel me? Like, like man. Like, I'm not fixing to lose dinner over this. <laughs> Praise God. I'm trying to help somebody out here tonight. <laughs> somebody has to initiate the positive power that comes with a law of reciprocity. Yeah. Hey, let me give you a few statements that Jesus said. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Hey, it's the law of reciprocity. It, it's God saying, hey, why don't you initiate mercy so that you get it back when you need it? Why don't you give it so you can get it? God is saying, hey, you can, hey, the Bible doesn't say blessed or the offended. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say blessed or the angry. Blessed or the bitter. Blessed are the naggers. The Bible says blessed are the merciful. Because they're going to get it back when they need it. Hey, can I teach you something here? You got to give mercy to get it. And here's the power. Even if somebody doesn't give you mercy, you give it to them anyways. Because somebody has to stop the negative effects of the law of reciprocity. Because you're letting somebody else control what you do. Instead of you taking authority and saying, I refuse to be the guy that sows unforgiveness. We got to be merciful, folks. Hey, the Bible says, give and it shall be. It's the law of reciprocity. The Bible says, forgive and you shall be. It's the law of reciprocity. The Apostle Paul knew this so well, and he wanted us to know this in Galatians 6 and 7. Be not deceived. You know what's crazy? There are people that actually deceive themselves and think, I can be a negative Nancy at all times, and I'm always going to get positivity back. No, baby. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We actually convince ourselves, no. I'm telling you, if I just keep being mean to this person, they're going to come around. God is saying, who are you trying to mock? You're trying, you're, you're trying to call me. Hey, the moment that you think that you can sow something different than, and get it back, you're basically calling God a liar. Because God is the one that said that this law of reciprocity exists. God is the one that's trying to teach us today that we got to start looking at the stuff that's going on in our life through these lens. Because this law was given to us to govern our behavior towards one another. Pastor, this person drives me nuts. Okay. I agree with you. Do you think you drive anyone nuts? Well, pastor, I mean, I actually think that I'm God's gift to earth. Okay, well, I'm praying for you. This is supposed to govern our behavior. This is how we're supposed to treat one another. Someone annoys you, you're like, God, make them less annoying or help me bear annoyance. Either way, have your way, Jesus. No, this is how it really this is how it's supposed to work. We're actually supposed to navigate this way with one another. Hey, it's not a sin to get annoyed by people. It's not. What it should reveal to you is there are things in that person that sparks a, an allergic reaction. Am I teaching in English today? 
Some folks got allergies for everything. I got peanut butter allergy. I got Brother Jesse allergy. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. See, the Bible wants us to know this is how we navigate. This is how we make it work. This is how we build a church. This is how we build relationships. Is somebody has to understand, hey, listen, you're annoying, but if I, if I give you that back, we're just going to go in this endless cycles of annoyance towards one another, and it's never going to end, and it's never going to get better, and we're never going to like each other, and it's never going to move forward, and one of us has to go to hell, or both of us. That's the truth. So I'm like, listen, God, all I'm asking you is let her mansion be on the other side of the galaxy than mine. I'm not asking for much. Can I put a fence up? It's wishful thinking, right? <laughs> but I ain't going to let nobody keep me out of heaven. So here's my theology. Hey, love me or hate me. You don't have to date me. <laughs> and here's the best part about it. If you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to accept that I'm going there too. And if you don't like the idea that God's letting me in, we already know where you're going. See, we've we got to get this revelation that we're, this is how we treat each other. Okay, I give mercy, I give love, I give patience, I give long-suffering, I give temperance, I, I give this stuff away. You know why? Because if you give it, you get it. So, so I, I've just convinced myself, I don't care if you're the most difficult person on the planet, I'm going to keep trying my best. You know why? Because there was a time when God looked at me and said, you are the most difficult person on the planet. Man, I just, I just saved every marriage in our church. Praise God. What I love about this, this law is that it makes, catch this, this law makes the individual responsible for what he or she does or doesn't do. Are you catching that? It makes you responsible. It doesn't give you the ability to say, well, they forced me to do it. No, you reacted that way, or you acted that way. Jesus is saying, I get it. Somebody slapped you in the cheek, and the, 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 you have permission to give them a beautiful left hook. But what if they have a better uppercut? What if they have MMA skills and put you in an arm bar? Are you catching that? Yeah. Hey, you can have a, uh, you know what I like about some boxers is, is they, they tell you this. Hey, there's a lot of boxers that can hit. There's a lot, few guys that can take a hit. Yeah. See, you can be good at hitting others. Isn't it amazing? I don't know why I'm going here. Isn't it amazing how the people that literally do the most hitting don't like getting hit? Yeah. I'm like, bro, you reap what you sow. Yeah. Like. That's what happens in life. Like, it, it, God is so cool. Like, you can forgive somebody, Brother Matt, and, and if they don't change, God will bring somebody else to do to them what they've been doing to you. God is so smart how he does that because God's like, hey, Matt, I don't want you to dirty your hands. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll bring somebody around that annoys the living tar out of them so that they can realize, hey, guess what? That's what you've been doing to Brother So-and-so. Let God take care of it. Let God work on them. Let God get in their heart and mind. But you got to make up in your mind, I'm taking responsibility for the way I treat people. I'm taking responsibility for the way I react to what people give me. Because I refuse to give hate for hate. You give me hate, I'm going to give you love. You, you give me a bunch of nonsense, I'm going to give you patience. Why? Because I want to get what I'm giving. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Try to help us move to the next level as Christians. What do I want to get from others is my question to you tonight. Pastor, I want to be in a church that everyone loves me and everyone likes me 
and everyone invites me over. And everyone, and then when I, when I get to hearing that, I'm just like, oh, God, they're leaving already. Because <laughs> that is not our church. <laughs> In fact, as you're talking, I'm not starting to like you. <laughs> and I got to pray through. Hey, I'm sorry, folks. I got flesh, too. I like to be honest. You know, I figure if you know that I have flesh, then the devil can't come to you and beat you up. Because you can be like, well, pastor has flesh, too, but he seems to be all right. You can do it. You can, you can overcome those weird thoughts that pop in your head. When you're hearing people talk, you're like, ooh. <laughs> Praise God. I love you. Praying for you. I don't even know what to pray. God, help. Hey, I'm not, I'm not minimizing your struggle. I, I want you to understand everyone has flesh. All of us have issues. I get weird thoughts pop up in my mind. I'm just like, ooh, did I think of that? That's crazy. Man, man, even I got to check myself for the Mandela. I'm on that Southwest flight. I'm like, America, America, you know. And I'm like, Holy Ghost is like, shut up. And I'm just like, America. I had that pastor shirt on, so I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so I take my hat off, too. I was like, ooh. I'm trying, uh, you got to get this. This is how you treat others because you know why? That's how I want to be treated. And so somebody has to initiate this stuff. Somebody has to be like, you know what, I'm gonna, I, I want to be loved, so I'm going to give love. I want people to be patient with me, so I'm going to give patience. I want people to respect me, so I'm going to give respect. I want people to tolerate me, so I'm going to be tolerable. I, you, you see how this works? You, you go out of your way to give it so that when you need it, it's there. You build this thing up. Hey, you don't believe this is true? David was the most merciful king that Israel had. A guy was spitting at him, yelling at him, cussing him out. And his mighty men said, hey, we're going to kill this guy. And David said, no, 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 don't, don't kill him. Just be merciful. Well, little did David know that the same mercy he gave somebody else, God gave him when he murdered Uriah. Hey, that mercy went into multiple generations because it was about three or four generations later when Israel needed somebody to help them. Guess who was the great-grandson of that boy? Mordecai. David's mercy produced them a leader in the future. See, sometimes the pastor is super patient and super merciful with parents because he understands, hey, I, if I got to deal with a nagging parent, but I get a new leader in a new generation, that works. That's what David, David was like, no, don't kill him. See, you got to understand how this works. This is our opportunity to do it one towards another. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Now, we talked about this relationship, right? So I'm going to close with this relationship. Because believe it or not, now this is crazy. This is crazy. How you treat others is a reflection of how you treat God. John said, how can you say you love your brother who you, but you, you love him who you, hmm, that's what Jesus said, that's what John said, that's what the apostles said. Now this is interesting, this blows me away, because this is meant to govern this relationship, but it's also meant to govern this relationship. Because if I have this right, I have this right. See, most people think they have this right, but this is all wrecked. And God's like, what are you talking about? You ain't right with me. You're not even right with your brothers and sisters. Let's read it so you can see I'm not lying. Look at this. 1 John 4, 19. We love him who initiated it. How you like them apples? He's the one that initiated the law of reciprocity. He's the one that said, I'm going to love you because if I don't, you'll never love me. Yeah. See, none of us here woke up one day and said, man, you know what? I'm just craving some God today. 
That's not how it works. Most of us woke up going, man, I'm craving some sin today. And it was that love of God that kept on just being kind and being merciful and being gracious and being forgiving and being there when everybody else abandoned you and not talking smack about you when everybody else did and always being a phone call away, being a prayer away. It, it, it was that constant love of God that was constantly there. And what it did, it started to, you know what? Uh, help me, Jesus. You know what the scripture says about Jesus? He was of no beauty to be desired. In other words, he wasn't, he wasn't someone the ladies saw and said, mmm, he cute. What does that mean? That means truth don't look cute from the outside. You got to get to know truth to say it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's principled. It's... And so, so Jesus grows on you. You ever meet somebody, they, they marry a really pretty person, you're like, they either got money or good personality. <laughs> Glory to God. If you have both, that's even better. We all know it's true. But Jesus grows on you, Brother Mandela. Because when all the friends that, that, that build you up, they, they bounce on you when you really need them. And then God shows up and goes, hey, I'm still here. He grows on you. You're like, you know what? You ain't the best looking, but man, you faithful. Man, there's an old song that says, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, go find yourself an ugly wife. <laughs> now, I don't suggest that, praise God, but it's a song, and it just came to my head right now. You, you could type it up. It's real, I promise. It's a real song. It's actually pretty catchy, too. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder and beer holder or whatever. That's why the world is all messed up. They can't even see right. Hey, hey, I'm trying to help you understand. Jesus initiated this love relationship with us. We didn't set it in motion. We didn't chase him down. He chased us down. We didn't come to him. We, we, think, we think we came up with the bright idea. You know what? Maybe I should get in a relationship with Jesus. He's actually really good. You didn't come up with that. Jesus came up with that. <laughs> Jesus told you, hey, you should be in a relationship with me because I'm the best you're ever going to get. I'm the best thing for you. I'm the best one for you. I'm the one that will love you when nobody else does. That's how cool Jesus is. Jesus said, I'm going to initiate this thing. Now it's your decision if you want to reciprocate. Now, it gets interesting. Let's jump over to our text now, brother, because I, 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 it's getting hot and I'm getting hungry. And I really want to finish this lesson and eat. See how much I love you guys? I want you guys to eat too. Hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. All right, 1 John 4, 7. Look at this. What is the greatest advice that Jesus can give us about the law of reciprocity? This sure fits me really big, huh? I know. I'm doing a lot better with my eating. The law of reciprocity, you know. Look at 1 John 4, 7. It's the will of God. Look at this. Beloved, let us love our favorite people. Let us love the people that don't annoy us. Let us love the people that don't agree with us. Let us love. Hey, the Bible says let us love one another. Why? For God is love. And everyone that is, and everyone that loveth is what? And what? What's that last part say? It's hard to love people when you don't know God. Because people are made in the and likeness of? Oh, it gets real hard, huh, to love people when you don't have a good relationship with him. But man, when you get this relationship right, you can say, I know what the world sees, but I see a good godly person in the making. I see someone that's going to change their family, their city, their world. I see potential. 
I don't see shipwreck. I see potential. I see blessing. I don't see curse. I see someone that can go to heaven, not burn in hell. I see good, not evil. Why? Because I know him. And he's the only one that knows them. I don't know their struggle. I don't know their problems. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they've been through. But he does. So if I can get to know him, all of a sudden you start looking at people and go, I actually feel bad for this person because God showed me that they're going through things that nobody else knows about. They're crying themselves. Yeah, they're annoying everybody in public, but they're crying themselves to sleep because they feel alone. So you got to know him to know that. So you got to say, God, I want to know you more because I know that you know the people I'm around. And the Bible says you got to know God to be born of God to love others. Because God is love. I can show you someone that I can show you someone that has God in them. That's how they treat others. Hallelujah. Next verse. I, hey, I'm just reading you what the Bible says, folks. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I love meeting people that tell me, like, I hate, I hate the church. I, I won't go to church, but I love God. I'm like, have you ever read First John? I don't need nobody around me. How can you prove you love God when you're supposed to love others to show that you know God and are of God and born of God when you're hiding out in your house? I love everybody, Pastor. I just don't hang out with anybody. I guess that's one way to look at it. It's easy to love everybody when you're around nobody. Are we reading the same Bible tonight? I'm telling you, folks, I'm trying to help, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help us get this. This is, this is what we need today. Look at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Hey, love is sacrificial. How you like them apples? <laughs> My God, love is sacrificial, not selfish. Check, please. I don't like this church. He tells me I got to sacrifice to prove that I love. Yes. Because it's all talk until you're willing to do it. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He's, in other words, you know why God is saying that? God is saying that because there's people that actually think I loved him first. No, you didn't. The Bible tells us that we didn't love him first. He loved us first. And he sent, he put his money where his mouth is. He sacrificed himself to be a appropriation for our sins. Yes. Beloved, if God so loved us, everybody say, if God so loved us. Okay, what's the caveat in verse 11? You're, we're on the wrong verse. Verse 11, please. Look at this. Verse 11. Next verse. Beloved, if God so loved us, if God loves Brother Mandela so much that he would die for him and carry his sins for him, you need to love him. If God so loved us, then we've got to love one another. There's no excuse for not loving God's people. There's no excuse for not loving one another. Pastor, you don't understand what they say. You don't understand how they act. You don't understand how they talk to me. You don't understand their tone. You don't understand this. No, I'll tell you what I do understand. I understand that you don't understand God. That's what I'm understanding. When people can't grow past that stuff, I'm like, God, at what point are they going to wake up and realize that they got to love others whether they like it or not? Hey, folks, hey, I'll be the first to my name is Jesse Gamboa, and I struggle with this. Anybody else struggle with this? Okay, I'm glad half the church does. The other half is lying, praise God. <laughs> half our church is honest, praise God. Lord, help us. Next week, we'll deal online, praise God. 
That's what the scripture says. No man had seen God at any time. How? So nobody can see God at any time. But look at this. Read this with me. No man has seen God at any time. God's invisible. John 4, 25, 4, 4, 24. God is a spirit. Okay? You can't see him. Right? If we love one another, God dwelleth. How do we show people God? God, this is so cool. How do you, how can people see the invisible God of the Bible? By showing them that invisible God of the Bible is inside of me. And I'm showing you that he's real. That's what it says. God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. In other words, when you're like, that's it, I am sick and tired of this person. The Holy Ghost inside of you says, don't do it. And you're like, uh, I forgive you, brother. The fact that we have to be perfected lets you know that we're imperfect with this. Let's you know that we all struggle, we all mess up, we all make mistakes, we all offend people, we all do dumb things. Why do we do it? Because we don't know how to love people. Because, you know what, most people can't love others because, number one, they don't love God. Number two, they don't love themselves. And so it's hard to love others when you don't even love yourself. And this is where the revelation of the love of God comes in. Because if you can get a revelation of God's love for you, you start to say, well, man, I, I love myself. Because, man, if the perfect, almighty, holy creator of the universe loves me, then that means I'm worth loving. So you got to get this love right to get this love right. Look at the next love. Look at this. Don't worry, I'm almost done. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. This is where I get confused because I'm not, like, really smart. I thought he was just in us, but you're in him now. I thought he was in us, but you're in him too. This is weird. It's like when you're drowning, right? The water's in you, but it's, you're also in the water, praise God. Yeah, that's the only way I can think about it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, I'm in the water, but I'm drowning in the water. I don't know how this works, praise God. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Ain't that neat how that works? I don't know how it works, brother. I'm just saying, you know, that's how it works. I don't have a scientific answer for this except jumping in the water and drowning. Praise God. What is God trying to help our church? What is God trying to help our marriages and our, our couples and everything going on? What is God trying to teach us? God is trying to teach us that our love for others has a direct correlation to our love for him. And he initiated an amazing love towards us, which means he's expecting an amazing love towards him. This is why God said, you shall love me with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Why? Because I loved you that way. Are you catching what I'm preaching today? This is why God says, I want you to be faithful. Why? Because God's looking at you going, because I've been faithful. This is why God wants you to be kind. Because God's going, hey, how kind have I been to you? God, so, so you actually have to look over your life. And this is, listen, this is, some, this is homework for you, okay? You can go home and do this for homework. You got to ask yourself, how has God treated me? And when you get that revelation, you know what you start doing? It inspires you. I want to treat him the way he treats me. I close with this. Give me some background something. Because we're all going to pray for one another today. We got to understand this. How many people don't want to go to hell? Well, I'm glad we all agree with that. But here's a revelation. That is not a perfect relationship. A 
perfect relationship is not that you don't want to go to hell. It's that you love him so much you want to go to heaven. And if he was in hell, I'd go to hell too. Because I love him. You got to understand this. When I first got converted, it was hell that scared the living daylights out of me. Hell brought me to repentance. Hell brought me to the altar. The fear of hell got me to obey the rules and the commandments and the laws and the precepts. But you know what made living for God so amazing and enjoyable and contagious? It was love. <laughs> it was realizing God, you never gave up on me. What in the world? Everybody gave up on me. My, my family would, oh, I wonder what's going to happen to him. But you never gave up on me. God has been faithful, sister, through everything I've ever done. Every mistake, every error, he's never not been faithful. He's never given up on me. He's never walked away. He's always loved me. He's believed in me more than I've believed in myself. He's given me more than I've ever given him or can ever give him. Let me just tell you, when you really love somebody back, they're not twisting your arm. You want to do it. I want to be holy because he's holy. I want to talk to him because I love him. I want to spend time with him because I love him. I want to learn about him and his word because I love him. I want to go to heaven because I love him. I want to be faithful because he's faithful. I want to be merciful because he's merciful. Hey, folks, it's time we take our relationship to the next level. And that is perfected through love. It's the law of reciprocity. Would you stand with me here today? Come on, God's reaching for us because he loves us. He just shared with us a principle that can heal marriages, heal families, heal relationships, heal all kinds of things. Somebody has to make a decision and say, God, I'm going to reciprocate what you've been giving me because you're a good God. You're a faithful God. Oh, come on, somebody. Would you stretch out your hands to heaven today? Come on, the Holy Ghost is reaching for you because he loves you. Come on, this is an act of love. This is not an act of anger or of hatred. This is an act of love. God loves you so much that he wants you to know that, hey, it's time your relationship with me gets bigger and deeper and wider. And it's time for you that you start living for me, not just out of the fear of hell, but for the love that you have for me. Come on, it's time we start loving him. It's, start, we, it's time we start obeying him because we love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. I don't have an issue obeying God. I love him. He's good to me. He wants the best for me. He died for me. He already proved that he wants better for me than I want for myself. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. I'm telling you, God wants better for you than you want for yourself. Oh, come on. The Holy Ghost is reaching for you right now. There, there is no reason. to. There is no reason. I'm telling you, there's relationships that need to be made right. Come on. There's, there's people that you've got to tell God, God, I'm going to love others the way you love me. I'm going to be merciful. Come on, somebody. This altar's open. Come on, pray for yourself. Make a commitment to take this next level, this next step. Come on, pray for somebody. If you feel that you got this down, praise God. Good for you. But